Hello, everyone. I'm going to give you a quick book overview. I don't do these very often. I have another one that I'm working on, um, but I was sent, this is the second time I was sent this particular book, Keeping the Faith. Um, it's by Norman De W. Fisk, PhD. And I want to talk to you about this. <laughs> Guy gave it, like I said, I don't know if he realized it or not, but he gave me, this is the second one he's given me. And I wanted to um, at least be able to let people know about it. And I'll give a link down in the description to where you can get this book if you'd like. Um, this is a good fundamental book. Before I get to that, I just want to uh, read the letter that he sent me. Uh, so you can get an idea. This just came in today. It says, Brother Collins, it's been a while since I sent an email or communication. I love your work and pray. We have many years to spread the faith to others. You have a great manner about you showing the love of the truth. I have finished the book I've been working on for over two years. I finished it as it will. Uh, I finished it as it will be, I suppose. It seems you have never stopped or you never stopped thinking about better ways to say things. That's certainly true whether you're given a sermon or whatever, you go back later and you think, man, I wish I'd have said it this way or I'd, or I'd have wrote my book. Um, had this sentence in there, or this example, that's understandable. It says, I have been able to use this book to convert numerous denominational people as have others. Um, I feel so blessed. Did not write this to gain any personal elevation or financial enrichment. It's been over two years and many, or just say a lot of money um, that he knows that he won't ever regain, but that's never been the goal. And so, again, that's not the goal of him. I don't know him personally. I can't even remember if I talked to him on the phone. I might have. I mean, he gave me his number and everything. I might have just been through email or something. But, uh, or this is the, oh, what he looks like. He's an older gentleman. But anyway, he seems to be very sincere. And I know all about that. Sometimes whenever you're just wanting to, you have a passion about what you're teaching, you want to just to get it out there. You want whatever, even if it, even if you lose money, you just because you know that it's important that what you've studied has been put out there. Uh, let's see. Said so it is nice now. Uh, oh, he's talking about how. Sorry, I'm doing a bad reading of what, he writ, uh, what he's written here. But he's, he has been making some sales of it. But anyway, he's, he's very passionate about teaching against the way of Luther and other reformers. Now they distorted the real meaning of the word faith. Uh, when they, they learned where faith alone doctrine was invented and spread worldwide. A very simple and seemingly innocent change that exploded into the most vile and corrupt doctrine coming out of the reformation period i hope you find something you can use which might help correct the worst doctrine nearly ever created by satan anyway keep up the great work and wonderful teaching and so anyway it's kind of the letter I didn't read it work and everything i read most of it and kind of bossed it up a little bit so i'm doing this very quickly so today i went ahead and i looked through uh, his book and um, kind of, I didn't look at every single word and, and look everything up, but just based on my own experience and things like that, I think it's a very solid book. It has nine uh, chapters in it. And so I've uh, I put together something that kind of gives you an overview of this book. And so I'm going to go ahead and start that process now. This is something that I have, like I said, uh, as I've went over this today, just kind of giving you a basic idea of each chapter. I'll start out with the introduction. So in the introduction, he addresses misunderstandings surrounding the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, which became prominent during the Reformation. He emphasizes the need for a thorough understanding of biblical terminology and its original Greek context to uncover the true meaning of the scriptures. He critiques the oversimplification of complex theology concepts and stresses the importance of obedience and works as an integral component of faith. Now, so true, there's a lot of people that just don't want to dig in very deep. They'll just look at the surface thing. They won't really look up 
what words actually mean and they'll just believe whatever someone tells them that they mean instead of trying to figure it out from the context. So he's encouraging people to dig deeper. Chapter one defines the terms. He begins to explain the critical role of language and context of interpreting scripture. He underscores the New Testament was written in Koine or Kenny, depending on how you want to pronounce it, Greek, a common language of the time, and emphasizes the necessity of understanding the original meaning of key terms. The chapter discusses how faith, that is pistis, and belief, I believe, pistio, are often misunderstood due to linguistic differences. He warns against using modern dictionaries to define biblical terms and stresses the importance of understanding these words in their original context. Fix introduces the concept of the faith, a specific system of belief revealed by God, distinguished from general faith. Now, in chapter two, it's what is faith? And so Fisk argues the biblical faith is more than just intellectual assent. It is an active trust in God that manifests in obedience. He challenges the notion that faith alone without corresponding actions is sufficient for salvation. The author explores Hebrews chapter 11, demonstrating that genuine faith always results in action. He asserts that the New Testament presents faith as evident-based trust in God's promises, not as mere belief without substance. This chapter lays the groundwork for understanding faith as a comprehensive, active response to God's commands. Chapter 3 is about believing, and this is an ex expansion on the previous chapter. Here he explains that believing involves more than just accepting facts. facts. It requires a commitment to act upon those beliefs. He contrasts different types of belief, highlighting that true belief is demonstrated through obedience. He references the example of Abraham, whose belief in God's promises was validated by his willingness to act, even to the point of sacrificing his son Isaac. This chapter emphasizes that belief, like faith, is incomplete without corresponding actions. Chapter 4 is justification by faith alone. He critically examines the doctrine of justification by faith alone, labeling it a big lie when interpreted as excluding any form of obedience. He argues that true justification involves faith that produces works. And he cites James 2, verse 24, which explicitly states that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. He asserts that reformers, particularly Martin Luther, misunderstood the biblical concept of faith and works, leading to widespread doctrinal errors. He clarifies that justification is a dynamic process involving both belief and action. Chapter 5 is salvation. What is it? This chapter provides a comprehensive exploration of salvation, defining it as encompassing justification, sanctification, and glorification. He distinguishes between being saved from past sins and achieving eternal salvation, emphasizing that the latter requires ongoing obedience and adherence to God's will. He discusses the nature of sin and its consequences, highlighting the need for continual repentance and faithfulness. The author argues that salvation is not a one-time event, but a lifelong journey of living according to God's commands. Chapter 6, John was not a Baptist. He clarifies that John the Baptist rose was not to establish a new denomination, but to prepare the way for Christ. He emphasizes that John's baptism was for the remission of sins and was a commandment from God, making it a necessary work. The chapter challenges the notion that baptism is merely symbolic, arguing instead that it is an essential part of the salvation process. He critiques those who downplay the importance of baptism, asserting that it is a work by, uh, ordained by God for the forgiveness of sins. Chapter 7, Not of Whose Works. It's a question, is the name of the title of it. In this chapter, Fisk tackle, tackles the relationship between faith and works, arguing against the dichotomy often presented in Reformed theology. He emphasizes that while salvation is not earned by human works, it is necessarily involves or it involves them as evidence of genuine faith. The author discusses the biblical teaching that faith without works is dead, illustrating this through the example of Abraham. 
He argues that faith and works are inseparable in the biblical view of salvation, with works serving as the fruit of a living faith. Chapter 8, Calvinism, predestination. That's what this chapter is about. Here he critiques the Calvinist doctrine of predestination, particularly the idea that God predestines some individuals to salvation and others to damnation without regarding to their actions. He argues that while God's foreknowledge is acknowledged, it does not override human free will. The chapter emphasizes the individuals are responsible for their response to the gospel and their choices determine their eternal destination. He advocates for a view of predestination that is consistent with a biblical presentation of God's justice and mercy. And then finally in chapter 9, the church in the Bible. That's the title. The final chapter discusses the biblical concept of the church emphasizing its unity and singularity under the headship of Christ. He critiques the fragmentation of Christianity into various denominations, urging a return to new, the New Testament model of the church. He stresses the importance of adhering to the apostolic doctrine and maintaining doctrinal purity. The author concludes with a call to Christians to seek unity based on the truth of the scriptures and to reject any teachings, teachings that deviate from the original gospel message. So in conclusion, Keeping the Faith by Norman D or D, Norman W. Fisk, let me get his name right, PhD, provides a thorough examination of critical theological issues, challenging widely accepted doctrines such as salvation by faith alone and Calvinist predestination. He emphasizes the necessity of understanding the original biblical language and context to grasp the true teachings of the scriptures. He argues for a balanced view that acknowledges the essential role of both faith and works in the Christian life. This book serves as a valuable resource for those seeking a deeper and more accurate understanding of Christian doctrine. It will help you give you some information you need to be able to deal with some of these issues that people bring up. And I'm very familiar with uh, the predestination part of it. Or I've been becoming more familiar with it because I just recently had a discussion that was online with someone that believes in that. And basically, uh, as he kind of points out, it's not available for everybody if it's just for certain people. And some of the things I've looked at with at least regarding predestination, it would make, make God someone that is showing partiality because he's making some be saved and some be lost. They don't have a choice in the matter. But anyway, overall, I looked this book over again, not in great detail. I did look at every page and I scanned through it. I looked at it. Because of my experience, I'm able to do that, and I didn't want to give a breakdown of every single paragraph and every single thing like that, but again, I see no reason why you might not want to have this book, and like I said, I'll see. I'll put a link down in the description. I get absolutely nothing out of this. Again, I'm just doing this because then this is the second time he sent the book. In fact, uh, here's the first book that he sent me, and now I've just been so busy, I haven't had time to do it, so I said, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to read through this very quickly and highlight some of the things that these chapters say and go ahead and do that for him because, again, he's very passionate about it, and I believe the things that he said in here are accurate, and, and they'll give you some great insight into faith and these different topics that we looked at. So I hope if you have the opportunity and it's something you're interested in that you'll, that you'll get his book and that you'll learn from it.